Hello everyone, this is chess expert David Luscombe, and I'm bringing you another really good broadcast. And today's game is uh, from the U.S. Chess Championship in 1964, and it was played between Grandmasters Bobby Fischer and Paul Binko. Now, Bobby Fischer has the white pieces, and he plays this really amazing tactical combination that we're going to look at. It's kind of a difficult combination to see, so... I, I'm going to see if you guys can spot the combination before I play it out. It's a pretty fascinating thing. Um, here, Paul Binko, after uh, Fisher plays bishop to d3, Binko plays bishop out to g4. And I really don't think that's the best move because Fisher can simply play h3. And he ends up developing his queen to a really good square, getting the bishop here and also some kingside space. So Bobby Fischer really comes out on top of that exchange and does very well. And instead of that, uh, probably a better move for Binko would have been simply to play c5 or even knight to a6. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But let's go ahead and follow the game a little bit more and then I'll come back to that. So here we have e5, dx, c5, and then f5. And we can see that Fischer has this really good attack going. And Paul Binko did need to challenge Fisher's center, otherwise Fisher has too much space, but e5 is really not the best way to challenge the center. The better way would have been to play c5, and we'll come back and, and look at that here in just a second. But the huge reason why playing e5 is not very good is that it locks in the bishop on g7. It does challenge the center, but so does c5, and c5 does not lock that bishop in. So that is the main reason here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at what Binko could have played. Instead of bishop out to g4, if Binko had played knight a6, and then the Fisher went ahead with his plan of f5 to try and attack on the king's side, then Binko could simply have played knight out to b4, looking to gain the bishop here and challenging white center with c5. And this is a really good setup for black here. It's very flexible. His pieces are coordinated together, and it does not block out the bishop on g7, which is very important. The game could continue kind of like this, and we can see that Black's position is just fine. In fact, the computer says that Black is now slightly better here. So that would be very good for Binko. Um, now, of course, after knight to a6, Fischer doesn't have to play f5. But if he does play f5, then Binko gets a very good setup. So that would have kind of uh, put a halt to Fisher's idea of f5. But uh, bishop to g4, giving up that bishop, I would not recommend in this variation. Some variations is actually a good idea because you can gain positional compensation for it. But after um, knight to c6, just it blocks c5. And that's not a very good idea because now Binko does have to challenge the center, but he can't do it with c5 must do it with e5, and that locks in the bishop on g7, and that allows Fischer to get this attack going. And Fischer is actually a little bit better here already. But then Binko makes another mistake and plays g takes f5, and this really fractures his pawn structure on the king side, and it makes it very weak. And we're going to see Fischer be, uh, take advantage of the weakened pawn structure and his attack on the king. And this attack comes pretty fast. Fisher is just, you know, uh, mobilizing his pieces to better squares. And then here Binko plays queen out to e8, which probably seemed like a good idea at the time. There's a very specific reason for this, but a better move would have been simply to play c5. This way, if Fisher does take, uh, black doesn't have to take back with the e-pawn, and can simply take with the c-pawn, making sure to keep... Uh, the e-pawn from moving so that the bishop on d3 cannot uh, participate in the attack. If this bishop can never get out, then it will be very difficult for Binko to defend. So that would be much better, because after queen to e8, Fischer can simply take here on d4, and then he could play e5 and get this bishop into the game, and that is an attack that's very difficult to stop. Now, of course, if Fischer were to play e5 right away, then he runs into problems with f5. And this was probably Binko's idea in order to force a queen trade. Because if Fischer were to try and move the queen away, 
then Binko could simply take the knight and take the pawn on b2, have this very dangerous pass pawn on b2. And yes, with bishops of opposite color, it's probably going to be about equal, but Fisher would not want to defend against this pass pawn on b2. That's just not a fun thing to do. So to avoid that, he would have to trade off the queens, and then that means that the attack fizzles out, and Binko has a very good game from there on. And in fact, the computer says that Binko is actually slightly better here. So Fisher doesn't uh, want to play e5 right away. Now this is where he's played a really amazing tactical combination. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can spot what Fisher played, and then unpause the video when you are ready, and we'll look at it in detail. Alrighty, Fisher played this really amazing interference tactic, rook to f6. And the idea here is simply to block the pawn on f7, prevent it from moving. Okay, so if uh, Binko were just to take the rook, wouldn't he just be a piece up? Well, then comes e5, and we see that the only defense to the queen and bishop attack is to push the pawn to f5, but the pawn can't move because the bishop is in the way. So the knight can move out to e4 to try to block it, but uh, it, checkmate is going to happen anyway. There's no way to stop it. Therefore, Bingo tries king out to g8, maybe looking to try and run with the king, so that way in case of a queen-bishop combination, maybe the king would have an escape square on f8. So that would be the idea. Um, after e5, checkmate 1 is threatened, so therefore h6 is played. And because the bishop is on g7 and hasn't taken the rook, it is able to, to defend the pawn. So, um, But then Fisher just simply plays knight out to e2 and gets his knight out of danger. And we can see here that uh, the only piece preventing the queen from getting to f5 and delivering a checkmate is the knight. So if the knight were to move, then uh, maybe knight to b5, then we have this checkmate. Therefore, after Fisher plays knight e2, Binko goes ahead and resigns. I mean, the only other thing that he could do is try to play queen out to e7, so that way, if a pawn takes, the queen could simply take the rook. But then Fisher could reinforce the rook, and then take the knight anyway, and also let him checkmate as well as be up by a lot of material. So therefore, it makes sense that after knight e2, Binko would re resign. But this was a really amazing tactical combination played by Fisher at the U.S. Chess Championship in 1963. Yeah, he just plays rook out to f6 here. A really amazing move, and it's a very difficult move to find. Because it looks like it's just a blunder. But it turns out to be really good because it interferes with the pawn's ability to move. And that allows Fisher to bring home the win. Well, thank you for watching, and I hope that you learned a lot from this game and that you can use it to win more games in chess. Well, as long as you're not playing against me. If you play against me, it's, it's okay to lose, but against other people, I, I do want you to win. So, see you next time.